Hi, hi everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, we're going to give another minute. Uh, we can seem to hop on. Thank you. All right, I'm going to get started here. Obviously, uh, the terrible team is just having a little bit of technical difficulty. They should be with us very shortly. Uh, but just wanted to take a moment here, introduce myself and kind of what we're doing here at Canner, if anyone's you know unfamiliar with our platform here. So first of all, good morning. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, obviously, with the having right around the corner, it's a very busy time in this space. So we do appreciate you taking the time to spend it with us to talk a little bit more about Bitcoin miners and really dive into the terrible story. Uh, so anyone here for the first time, my name is Josh Siegler and I lead the Cantor Crypto and FinTech Equity Research Platform here. Uh, here at Cantor, we've been really focused on providing as much educational content as we can across the crypto industry. Now, the reality is if you're focused on, you know, equity research and, you know, the public space, there isn't that much that's currently investable for public investors. It's really the Bitcoin miners, you have Coinbase and Galaxy, MicroStrategy, you know, the, the universe is very small. However, we take the view that as we progress through 24, enter the back half of 24, first half of 25, there are going to be more and more of these names coming public over time. So we want to help prepare investors for when that eventually happens. So what does that look like today? Well, we provide full equity research coverage on seven public Bitcoin miners, uh, including TerraWolf, who will be joining us shortly. Our initiation reports include significant deep dives on the individual miners themselves, uh, it provides everything from understanding hash, cost per coin, things along those lines. I highly recommend them to any investor really looking to understand the fundamentals of each company and really how they uh, differentiate from each other. <laughs> Second, we publish a weekly one-page tear sheet that's called the Bitcoin Brief. It's a simple recap of Bitcoin news and performance for the week prior. Uh, twice a month, we publish a piece called Demystifying DeFi. In this industry report, we provide an educational deep dive into any relevant topic across the crypto industry. Prior notes have included things like the likelihood of a Bitcoin spot ETF approval, Ethereum centralization, CBDCs versus stable coins, and everything in between. Uh, so it's been, you know, quite quite a ride to get that off the ground, and hopefully it provides, you know, a good weekend reading piece whenever you get around to it. Finally, we hold several expert KOL calls with industry leaders across the space, including Bitcoin mining management teams, such as today, regulatory experts, and even professors. Uh, but today, we're very excited to be hosting the TerraWolf team. Uh, looks like they're logging on here. So we're going to be joined by Paul Prager, co-founder, chairman, and CEO, Nazar Khan, co-founder, CTO, and COO, and Carrie Langley, CSO. So it looks like we have Carrie and Nazar on. So thanks for joining us. Yeah, and I'm sorry that we're late. We we are all together and we were trying to be together in our conference room, but our conference room Zoom was not cooperating. So we were sitting in uh, a waiting room hoping uh, it would work. So we, we disseminated and we're now in our offices. So thanks again and apologize for the wait. Well, Paul we're all here now and uh, excited to get up and running here. So just for everyone online to be aware, we have 45 minutes or so of prepared questions, but if any investor on the line would like to submit their own question, you can do so in the Zoom Q&A box below, or you can email me directly at josh.siegler at canter.com. Again, that's josh.siegler, spelled S-I-E-E-G-L-E-R at canter.com. All right, with that, Paul, Nazar, Kerry, thanks for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks, Josh, for having us. 
We couldn't figure out how to do it from the conference room, but <laughs> we're don't really, worry though. We can we're really the HBC, but don't <laughs> worry about it. <laughs> I will say you guys aren't alone. Uh, we've run into that issue before. So, um, you know, the joys of modern technology. Why don't we start with, you know, a quick one-on-one, if you will. You know, what is terrible for any investor who may be relatively unfamiliar with the story? Um, you know, the genesis of, of Terra Wolf is we're an energy infrastructure shop, and I think that hasn't changed. We're an energy infrastructure shop. We've got a management team with decades of experience, um, energy supply optimization, you know, sourcing stuff, fixing stuff, uh, generating electricity, and looking for the highest value uh, use for that, for that electricity. Uh, Wolf has two sites, Lake Mariner, upstate New York, and Nautilus down in Pennsylvania at the Nuke. Um, it's a bit of a unicorn, Nautilus, with two cent power, but Lake Mariner is particularly compelling because it's massive. We have land, water, uh, and energy. It's it's scalable, um, pretty exciting. Uh, currently, we're at 8x a hash, plans to grow to 10 uh, by year end. Uh, we've got 50,000 miners deployed. Um, we probably have the highest level of management uh, and insider ownership of any of the public miners out there. Uh, and that's not because we were just given founder shares. I mean, I personally invested, you know, almost, you know, 16 million bucks last year into the company through debt and equity. Um, so I think we're pretty, pretty, pretty unique in that regard. Um and the last thing I would want to say is our management team has worked together for a very, very long time. So it's it's not a bunch of talented individuals that got together and said, hey, we want to be in Bitcoin mining. It's an energy infrastructure group uh, that's been together. I mean, collectively here, I think Carrie and I are together 15 years plus, Nazar and I over 20. So it's a management team that's really seasoned in energy and have done it together. So we're good with cycles. We know how to handle that that, that stuff. I said yeah. that at this point, but it's not. ESG is the last thing I'd want to mention, Josh. You know, we have a real ESG um, orientation. It's absolutely at the core of what we do. I don't think we're necessarily seeing value for that currently in the market, but I think it's uh, elemental to what we do uh, and elemental to what we will continue to do. Yeah, so we're going to be diving more into all these pieces, be it the Nautilus site, your energy costs, the ESG component. But, you know, something that you perhaps didn't say that I think, you know, speaks to Terra Wolf's, uh, you know, unique positioning is, you know, when you first introduced the company, you didn't say we're a Bitcoin miner. You said, you know, we're energy data center play. And I think it's really a unique position amongst a lot of these companies out there, which are Bitcoin miners, because you, from my perception, at least, Terra Wolf is very much an energy first data center first approach to Bitcoin mining. Is that right? Yeah, it, it is what we are, right? It, the skill set is that we know how to, well, well, we're vertically integrated, but we know how to source energy um, and everything that you need uh, to, to be able to mine Bitcoin effectively or to run a, you know, AI or HPC business effectively, which is to have the land, to have the water, to have the energy and to have a regulatory skill set so that you can sort of be there on a long-term basis and 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 ultimately build something the investors are proud of and make money with. Yeah, absolutely. So that being said, you know, Paul and Nazar, what really drove you to to formulate the idea for Terrible? You know, where did this come from, given your background? So, um, and again, this team's been together, you know, 15 of our 20 top, top executives been together at Beowulf Energy for, you know, 15, 20 years. Um, so we we own and operate power plants. We built power plants. Uh, we developed power plants. And ultimately, um, as the demand for electricity shifted, you know, from high tension customers, you know, to sort of a more retail orientation, we're looking for, and, and contracting changed in the power business, right, Josh? We used to sort of sell electricity to a muni or, or utility for 20 years and lock in long-term fuel supply agreements and finance and capture that spread. As, as that market went away, because uh, it became more sophisticated, rightly or wrongly, they thought they didn't need to, to have such long-term contracts. 
they exposed themselves to spot, but it made it harder to sort of manage that on a risk reward basis uh, if you were a power company. So we were looking for new ways to sort of find value for our electricity. Um, and Nazar, um, who's my partner here and co-founder and dear friend, you know, he he brought the notion of Bitcoin mining to the table. And I could tell you it was a battle. I mean, we we discussed it at investment committee meetings in our group for a year uh, before ultimately um, we decided to build out for somebody else. And that was Marathon back in the day. Um, and we built out for them a mining center at a, at a plant uh, I owned in Montana. Um, and so, uh, we built it, um, we, we learned the Bitcoin mining business through that process. We ended up with millions of shares in Marathon back in the day. Um, and so we decided that, you know, we could either grow with them or grow with others because we had all these energy sites, uh, or we could try and do it ourselves. And we opted to do it ourselves because we like betting on, our own risk reward approach. Um, we knew how to manage cycles. Uh, we knew how to procure contract um, and find the highest value for our energy. Um, and ultimately we, we really wanted to do something that was focused on uh, green because we had been in the power space and we had seen how the market had evolved uh, to renewables. Uh, and, and nuke's not a renewable, but it's green energy. And we thought this is the this is where we wanted to be. It's where we wanted to be because it was the right thing to do. But it's also where we wanted to be on a cost basis, because you, you're taking away the the risk of regulatory taxes and higher operating costs when you when you have you know the kind of green approach that we do. So we decided to sort of go off on our own and form Terrible. Yeah, understood. And it's it's funny, Paul, because I remember we met about two years ago now, and at the time you were saying a lot of the same things. And it really feels like Terrible has just executed on everything you've talked about in the past. You know, building scale while maintaining that green energy, you know, uh, uh, competitive advantage, if you will, and hopefully, you know, be relatively insular from regulatory concerns moving forward because of that, you know, strategy. Um, you know, I want to dive a little bit deeper into the operations here. So can we give uh, investors, you know, a quick overview on the difference between Lake Mariner and Nautilus? I think that would be helpful. Your two major sites. Sure. Paul, do you want me to take that one? Sure. Sure. So our Lake Mariner facility is located in upstate New York. It's on the shore of Lake Ontario. We own that facility 100%. And I think that, you know, that facility holds a dear place in our heart because of its background and its story. It was the site of the last operating coal plant in the state. Um, so what was a 700 megawatt coal plant, which has now been retired and dismantled, um, is now the home to a Bitcoin mining facility, which today is at 160 megawatts, but the site has the capacity and scalability um, to go up to 500 megawatts. Um, so we source 93% zero carbon in that area. The site is located about 25 miles from Niagara Hydro. Um, so, um, you know, a truly expansive site right on the lake. It has a lot of the very uh, valuable infrastructure having been the site of the coal plant previously. And we've actually converted many of the original employees that had been at the site for decades operating the coal plant now operate our, our mining facility there. Um, our second site is the Nautilus facility in central Pennsylvania. That's the first Bitcoin mining facility in the U.S. to be directly connected to a nuclear power station. We're partnered there with Talon. Um, we have 50 megawatts operational today, and um, we put out a press release a few weeks ago that we intend to expand that facility by another 50 megawatts, bringing our total uh, operating capacity at the site to 100 megawatts. Understood. I just want to add something in there, Josh, because mm -hmm. I want to try and throughout this talk about relative value. I mean, I don't know if you read grants, but I used to read grants all the time. And I particularly got a kick when he, he took some sort of local element like, hey, the bakery in Greenwich is full and they're selling out of all their pastries. So the market's going to be moving up, you know, it was like that. But I think your your investors could tell a lot when they look at our sites. If you look at our sites um, you and or meet the people who staff them uh, and we welcome people to our to our to Lake Mariner Nautilus all the time. 
we're at a whole different level than anybody else. And I like I like to think, you know, we say we're vertically integrated. Other guys say they're vertically integrated. But I think to a large degree, it's crap. You know, they have host third party providers. They're getting the power from somebody else. Um, you know, we own our sites. We we maintain our own facilities. We build our own facilities. We operate our own facilities. So, I mean, if you visited Lake Merida, um, it's a, it's a completely different, you know, peerless uh, enterprise up there um, that I that I think is important because all sites aren't created equally, not just from the economics, but from the long term operation. I think in the past month, if you take a look at our performance versus like other guys, these plants, you know, down in Texas, they're going to have a lot of degradation. I mean, those are tough operating conditions down there. Take a look at what we have going on at Nautilus Lake Mariner. Again, these sites are, are top shelf. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I think just to play devil's advocate for a bit, what a lot of your competitors will talk about is the reason they're willing to bear through that really intense climate high winds, dust, you know, high depreciation on machines down in Texas is because of energy prices, right? Because you can curtail, you can, you know, uh, trade power essentially and realize these low power costs. Yet, you know, in our uh, proprietary cost per coin analysis that we run every quarter, you've de now demonstrated for multiple quarters that you have the second lowest variable cost, so energy cost amongst all miners at scale. So that's reflective of the power strategy you've enabled up here in the Northeast. Uh, without all those risks associated, which could have higher downtime or what have you. Uh, yeah, so I want to talk a little. Josh, yeah. just for a second, just to go back to that. Nobody else really is nearly as transparent as Patrick Fleury is on our team. It's very true. <laughs> showing our cost to mine. So you'll see a lot of guys say, oh, our cost of energy is this. No, it should be all in cost to mine. How much have you spent on the coffee for the office? What's your energy <laughs> costs? What are the maintenance costs? The maintenance costs in severe environments are much more significant. And if you don't own them, so when a piece of gear goes down, a third party's coming in with a change order and you're paying two and a half times the hourly rate because it's in the middle of, you know, midnight, you know, midnight to three shift, the graveyard shift or something. So it should be about all in cost to mine. And I don't think anybody else is out there with that. We are. Um, but again, it is part site location is enabling for us site you know the the fuel source is enabling for us it's what makes lake marin and nautilus particularly compelling yeah absolutely and i just want to reiterate that point i think you guys have been one of the most transparent miners out there uh and very helpful in understanding your cost structure which is incredibly important as we head into the having mm -hmm. um so that being said, let's dive a little bit deeper into these energy contracts just so we understand them better. So let's start on Nautilus. Like you said, you have a two cent fixed cost of power there. That's the best we've seen on a fixed uh, basis. So Nazar, can you elaborate a little bit more on what's going on behind that contract and how you're able to achieve the two cents? Sure. Um, that, that price is reflective of, again, an understanding of the grid and how it works and how you know supply and demand is balanced between the generators and the demand. We started working with Talon in late 21. <clears throat> um, they have a two and a half gigawatt nuclear facility. Um, and given the significant penetration of intermittent resources, you know, largely wind and solar, that nuclear facility that used to run baseload at 97% all the time was having to cycle up and down. And so they were looking to be able to bring a fixed load that they knew they could kind of dump power to 24 seven every single day of the year. And we were in the space and given, again, our background, you know, Carrie worked with, you know, the former CEO there. And so we had relationships that allowed us to engage with them and say, hey, let's really peel back the onion and understand what Bitcoin mining really is. It's not, you know, so, you know what, what you think. And once we educated them on how Bitcoin mining worked, they really bought into it and said, hey, this is a the perfect balancer for optimizing the value of our nuclear facility. And if you look at what happened kind of in that time frame, both at the federal level and at state levels, there was a number of uh, production tax credits uh, given to nuclear operators. And, and why was that done? That was done because again, these nuclear operators went from operating at a 95% plus baseload level to something that was much more variable where they'd have to drop down to 60% back up. And when you think about the cost of a nuclear facility, it's all fixed cost, right? You have a, a big maintenance uh, capex. Um, you know, every other year the generator goes down and you have your fuel. And so those are all fixed costs. And if you are running the facility at 95% plus, you can amortize those fixed costs over a larger base. If you have to cycle that facility, 
your per unit economics on that nuclear facility really go up. And so we were able to come in and provide this sink and that's reflected in the cost of power that we have. And so that's how we were able to kind of, you know, negotiate this, this, you know, very attractive price point where we were again, a sink that allowed them to further optimize the value of the nuclear facility. And they took that even further. They said, well, great, you know, we understand Bitcoin mining and we think, you know, from, you know, kind of the HPC side, there could be greater loads as well. And so the total campus that, that, that Talon built was, you know, 950 megawatts, you know, Amazon just announced a transaction where they bought into 750 megawatts. And so it further highlights again, this, this importance of energy infrastructure in the high performance kind of compute market. Again, Bitcoin mining is one form of high performance compute. And as Paul was saying earlier, our entrance into this was really an understanding that there is a meaningful and significant transition happening with respect to how power is being supplied across the country. And we're adding, we're taking out dispatchable resources and adding mostly intermittent resources. And so understanding how you can have loads to integrate back into that system is extremely valuable. And we're already now seeing, you know, I think even just this week, I saw four or five headlines that said, how are your utilities gonna deal with the increasing demand from high performance compute loads. And so in this environment, we think, you know, our strategy, our approach and our nuanced and experienced understanding of how the grid works, how the regulators work, how they're going to tackle these issues, it bodes well and allows us to kind of maintain the, the low prices that we have. Yeah, understood. And we're going to come back, touch on HPC in a little more detail, especially, you know, given your unique positioning to really capture that market amongst the Bitcoin miners. But I just want to revert back to what you were talking about with the Talon sale of the Cumulus Data Center to AWS. Can you help us understand what that actually means for Nautilus from your perspective, right? Uh, you also put out uh, alongside that press release saying that you plan to option the 50 megawatts uh, that you have available to expand Nautilus. So let's touch on that. What does Nautilus look like a year from now, if you will? It's no change. So, you know, are we, our landlord used to be Talon and today our landlord is Amazon. Um, but with respect to Nautilus, with our cost of power, our ability to operate the mine and our ability to expand, all of those rights remain exactly the same. So a year from today, hopefully we'll be, you know, kind of, you know, building out that incremental 50 and we'll, you know, we'll be mining away. Got it. That's helpful. I could argue it makes us more valuable. I mean, I think that you have additional optionality because you have a, a new landlord at, at the facility who wants, you know, they're hungry for all the power they can. So, so just, you know, on the four corners of the page, it's got to make our asset there more valuable. Yeah. yeah. And to Paul's point, when you think about it, I mean, I think the Amazon deal also showed that the underlying infrastructure, if it comes with zero carbon power at scale, and a low cost of power is very valuable. And when we think about, you know, in the Bitcoin mining space, what does that mean? You know, we all talk about our cost of power, but when you take a step back and look at it in the context of more broadly what's happening, you know, we think that transaction also highlights that good infrastructure, again, with access to zero carbon, low cost power um, is extremely valuable, um, you know, today and, and going forward. Yeah, absolutely. Something you got to think about because you know the market today it, it's got this uh, an odd sort of value mechanism you know it and that's because there aren't institutions really big in the in the public minor space just yet but i mean you have people valuing exahash like at whole different levels companies that have equal amount of exahash generation are being valued you know 200 percent of one another that's pretty odd but what's not being valued is, is so worse than that, though, is what's not being valued is the energy infrastructure of the groups. People are saying, oh, you need tons of capital to grow to, you know, to buy miners. And, and but what people don't realize is you have tons of value already in a company if you have the energy infrastructure. Mm -hmm. That's just not going to come out as sort of capital that you need to grow, but it's going to be in the capital that you need to operate because we'll have the energy infrastructure. Somebody else is going to buy it. They can't buy it because now they're competing against all these high speed guys. So they're going to be paying for it in high fees and maintenance charge and, and, and power costs. So yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, I think it's a testament to the power of your infrastructure when we think about AWS moving in, right? Like from my seat, it's essentially proof of concept that your infrastructure will be able to be used as these high performance computing data servers. And yet it didn't really cost you anything, right? It was someone else doing this deal, but the infrastructure is a direct parallel to you. So it's super interesting from that perspective to think about what that means for the future. 
Uh, but, you know, with that being said, I want to shift gears real quick. Let's talk about Lake Mariner, the other site. It's bigger. How does the power, uh, you know, costs work in Lake Mariner compared to Nautilus? So at Lake Mariner, we're connected to the grid. And as I mentioned earlier, um, we benefit there from really an abundant supply of renewable resources. And that's primarily hydro, given that we're located so close uh, to Niagara Hydro. If you think about our zone, um, we've got um, about, I think the peak capacity there is about 2.7 gigawatts. Robert Moses itself is 2.4 gigawatts. And then we've got another seven gigawatts of renewables that are in the queue, including 100 megawatts of which are actually um, proposed to be sited on our site at, at Lake Mariner. So we've got a tremendous amount of supply, uh, not a ton of demand upstate, right? The demand is all downstate. So if you think about New York, um, you can think about it sort of as a funnel, if you will. And Lake Mariner sitting at the top of the funnel New York City's at the bottom, uh, at the bottom of the spout. And unfortunately, due to transmission constraints, there's blockage, right? And so all of the renewables are, are upstate and available to us. And our facility is the perfect um, use for that to sort of balance, both balance the grid, right? Because we are participating in demand response uh, mm -hmm. and also, you know, turn that valuable low cost power into, into something worth value that can be traded globally. Absolutely. You take advantage of a stranded power resource while also being able to help stabilize the grid up there. Yeah, that's right. And also, if you think about it, sort of the, the availability of renewables is, is what makes our site so unique as you think about it from a hyper hyperscale data perspective, right? Because, you know, because of the industry, um, the history of industry in that region, the local transmission and distribution is relatively overbuilt and so requires minimal upgrades to support you know, high megawatt build outs there. And we've got access to water, temperate climate, um, expansive land. And so it really checks a lot of the boxes, including sort of the ESG box, which is obviously very important to the I mean, Magnificent Seven and, and others in the space. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit more about ESG since we're on that topic. So Paul, I know you've been, you know, really championing uh, Wolf's 90% zero carbon energy, focus on appealing towards more ESG investors over time. I don't think we've really seen that thesis play out just yet in terms of ESG investors moving into the space. But do you ultimately see that as the future uh, for how investors should be thinking about uh, this industry? The answer is yes, absolutely. I'll let Carrie handle it because she'll yell at me if I talk about ESG when it's, if she owns that bucket. <laughs> but the answer is the market's not paying for ESG right now, right? I mean, we're still not value. My, my XH is not being valued equal to a couple of other fellows in the market. So we're definitely not being valued on the ESG front, but I think institutions look at it and it's critical. It's yeah. core to what we do. We are mm -hmm. not going to change our approach because it is the right thing to do. It's that simple. Uh, you know, we don't need Bitcoin mining to take more hits from, from some of the politicians on, on the basis of it's, it's bad, it's raising prices, it's using fossil fuels. When we can, we can be an ESG oriented company and avoid all sorts of regulatory flack. But go ahead, Carrie. Yeah, I think for us, first of all, it, as Paul mentioned, it's sort of fundamental to, to even before launching a public company, the way that we sort of operated. And so it wasn't as if uh, these things were sort of added to our, you know, the way that we do business, it sort of has been there. And I think when you think about ESG, it sort of forces you to think about long-term value creation versus near-term profits. And right now, you know, investors in this space are very focused on near-term profits. So there's concern almost is, well, that's all great, but I hope you're not spending money towards ESG. Well, the reality is, you know, we are probably among, if not the most profitable miner of Bitcoin in the space. And so we can, we can deliver both, right? And so I think if you, if you think about it, there's little debate about whether being good stewards of the planet or treating employees equitably or, ensuring that our management and board are properly overseeing the company. Um, and ultimately, it is going to be deeply important because I think it is value creating both to shareholders and to regulators. So I don't know, um, Josh, if you saw, but yesterday we actually released our first annual report sort of highlighting all the you know accomplishments we've made and, and plans for the future in this regard. And so we're proud of where we stand. We know that there's work to do, but um, Again, it's, it's sort of core to what, who we are and what we are. Yeah, and Carrie, if you wouldn't mind, can you just give investors the uh, 
help them understand the difference between net carbon neutral and zero carbon? Because I feel like some of your peers throw out carbon yeah, neutral. Yeah, absolutely. And so there's a big difference. Um, being zero carbon means that the, the electrons that you are utilizing emit zero carbon. Being carbon neutral means that you may be running off of gas or other carbon fuels, but then you're buying offsets. And so it's almost like you're paying your way out of, um, of using or offsetting. So it's, it's a financial mechanism. It's not truly zero carbon. It just means that you've paid to give yourself a stamp that says you've paid for, you've paid extra for using that carbon. Understood. Um, and, you know, I, I agree with you, Paul. I don't think, you know, it's currently being baked into valuation, but I think, you know, as the space gets more mature over time, uh, it will definitely be something that investors should take into consideration, not just because of regulation, but also just what it means for the planet, right, um, moving forward. So, Paul, you alluded to this earlier. The major question we get on pretty much every Bitcoin miner in the space is what's next? What's next? What's next? You know, everyone wants to understand the growth outlook. Uh, maybe if we could start just talking about Bitcoin mining, what, you know, how is Terrible thinking about growth right now? You've talked about the 50 megawatt option at Nautilus, but you also have a lot of megs that you could expand into at Lake Mariner. So, you know, how are you thinking about growth right now? Naz, you want to want to feel that? So we have the ability to grow far more than, you know, we can kind of get done in 24. So for 24, we've outlined, you know, building force coming up in June, uh, by mid-June. Mid end of June, uh, that's a 35 megawatt building. Uh, we'll be able to put up 2x a hash uh, in that building. Uh, by year end, we'll put up building five, which is about 40 megawatts, um, and we'll put up another, you know, 3x a hash or so um, in, in that building. So that will get us to uh, about 250 megawatts of operation at the Lake Mariner facility. Um, we envision that facility will be 500 megawatts by the end of 2025. And so in 2025, we will then develop 250 megawatts of capacity. Um, currently, you know, we have a 50 megawatt module that we're building, you know, roughly 50 megawatts, depending upon, you know, kind of equipment availability. And so the baseline is it will just roll out 50 megawatt uh, Bitcoin mining buildings that will come up every, you know, three months or so. Um, so that's, you know, that's what gets us to kind of 28 plus exa hash of targeted capacity by year in 2025. And again, that's at a site that we own, that we operate, we control, and all we really have to do is continue to build, you know, buildings that we've done before. And so the team, you know, every building that we put up has been better than the previous one. We've been able to tweak it and refine it. And again, I think it's important to, to, to remember, we used to design and build power plants for a living. For 20 plus years, you know, we built our own power plants. We built power plants for third parties. We operated our own power plants. We operated power plants for third parties. And so a lot of that expertise and experience with respect to design, engineering, working with subs, construction, construction management. These are skills that are, you know, deeply ingrained in our company and all of our staff. And so at Lake Mariner, it's really just rolling out at the site that we own, you know, another 250 megawatts of capacity in 2025. Mm -hmm. uh, when we start to think about, you know, what are alternative uses for it? You know, I think, you know, we announced um, uh, a couple months back a two megawatt pilot. Um, and the reason we did that is, is that if you think about the high performance compute space, it's different from Bitcoin mining in that, you know, every day that goes by in Bitcoin mining, in theory, you know, for that same miner, for that same, you know, terahash that you're putting up, you're getting back less, whether the network hash rate is going up or the halving, right? So just by definition, it's a race against time in some sense. And so you're always in a hurry to get capacity up. What we see is happening in the high performance compute space is very different. You know, I was out in San Jose for the NVIDIA GTC Global Tech Conference uh, a couple of weeks ago. And, you know, a number of different folks said, you know, the, the, the capacity for compute is doubling. You know, and some people said every four months, some people said every six months, some people said every eight months, but whatever it is. I mean, when you think about the amount of capacity that, that's needed to support that is doubling every, you know, whether it's four months or six months, you extrapolate that out over two years time, I mean, that's gonna be a very significant load. And so our view on that has been, let's make sure that we're designing for something that not just, that means not just the, that meets not just the needs of the GPUs that exist today, but the GPUs that will likely come two and four years from today. Mm -hmm. and those GPUs are gonna be much more dense and are going to have far more significant cooling needs than what exists today. And yeah. when we 
Look, and we've done a very thorough kind of analysis of the traditional data center landscape. And it's clear to us that the legacy data centers will not be able to meet the needs of kind of the upcoming GPUs. And whether that was the Blackwell chip that's coming out, you know, um, later this year that, that NVIDIA announced, you know, at, at that GTC, or even the subsequent chips are going to com come from that, they're going to need, you know, some form of liquid cooling. And again, our site at Lake Mariner, we used to run a coal-fired power plant there that we retired. It has had the ability to pull millions of gallons of water from Lake Ontario. And so again, now designing something where we can now use that water for high performance compute with the scale that we're talking about at the cost of power that we're talking about with zero carbon energy, you know, you start to see that the opportunity that we have is very unique. And so our approach has been, let's be methodical in making sure that we're designing the infrastructure that's gonna support it in a way that makes sense. And again, that meets not just the needs of what's coming today, but what's gonna be yeah. coming in the next 24 and 36 months and then scale from there. Because again, once we figure it out, you know, taking two megawatts and making a 10 and making a 20, that's just kind of a construction exercise. And so we're in that process now. We think that initial two megawatts will be up, you know, online here, July, August timeframe. We're in discussions with a number of different counterparties with respect to kind of utilizing that capacity. And again, the, the main focus of that initial, um, this initial exercise really is more on the design side. You know, I, we want to make sure that what we're building, the facility that we're building, will be able to kind of meet, meet, meet these increasing needs. Yeah, uh, all that makes sense. You know, focused on building the data center of tomorrow instead of just persisting in the today. Uh, I agree with that strategy. But you know what I think is interesting too, when we're thinking about those megawatts and the optionality of those megawatts, you know, building infrastructure first, is compared to a lot of your peers, which have announced really large purchase contracts for like thousands, hundreds of thousands of Bitcoin mining rigs, some without the infrastructure to even plug them in at, you guys haven't announced a large purchase order of miners just yet. So can you walk us through kind of the, the reasoning behind, you know, not putting something into place uh, just yet? Sure, I mean, in October of last year, Bitmain announced the S21 with great fanfare. They announced a 200 terahash machine at 17 and a half joules per terahash. Wonderful, you know, you know we've, we've got some uh, coming that we'll, we'll be populating building for. Just last week, they announced the S21 Pro, 234 terahash, now at 15 joules per terahash. And that's likely not the last iteration they're gonna have. Six months from today, they're gonna come out with another machine. 12 months from today, they'll have another machine. And so as we think about how do we populate our Bitcoin mining facilities with the most efficient uh, units out there, you know, we think the, the approach should be is, is kind of take the latest and greatest at the time, use by what we need and get the benefit of that. Um, if you look at kind of the pricing uh, as well, um, you know, in, in October, they came out 14 bucks a terahash. That was for a limited period of time. Most of the folks locked in um, capacity at $16 per terahash. You know, since then on a spot basis, things have gone up. You know, we were, you know, we've been able to kind of lock in some optionality around that, the miners at $16 a terahash as well. So we think we're protected, but again, we also don't feel the need to kind of lock in large scale orders for hundreds of thousands of miners kind of coming out to 2025 knowing that there will likely be kind of better units like that, that come out. And the other thing that, you know, we've kind of our view is, is that in the last cycle, you know, kind of 2021 time frame, you know, there was this shortage of chips. There was a shortage of miners, you know, minor prices went to 60, 80 bucks a terahash. You know, given what we see now and given the supply chains that exist, it's, you know, we think it's unlikely we'll find that kind of a scenario, right? So, so one, you know, reason to kind of lock in the price is to protect against kind of a meaningful increase in the underlying price of the equipment. Um, and so you put down 10%, right? You put down, you know, your insurance premium to kind of protect against it. You have these large orders, you're locked into a particular type of machine. The view that we've taken again is, is that we, we know what we're going to build, right? We've got an, a, a capacity of up to 250 megawatts. Um, you know, that's, when you put it all together, that's 75,000 machines if we used it all for Bitcoin mining. Um, mm -hmm. But we think, you know, we've, we've been able to kind of manage, you know, some of that price exposure. But we do think that, you know, the availability of, 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 of miners is going to be far more than the, uh, the availability of infrastructure to place those miners. And if that's the case, if we have good infrastructure at a low cost, we think, you know, we'll be able to kind of figure out the miner at the best possible price. 
Yeah, I, I agree, you know, given the competitive d dynamics right now around those Bitcoin miners and the production of them, miners themselves are essentially commoditized while infrastructure just serves a premium right now. And to that point, let's talk about HBC. I mean, it's it's something that, you know, we've been getting a ton of inbounds on even during this call uh, and just want to make sure we understand both strategy uh, to the best of our ability. So on your earnings call, you talked about a barbell approach to HBC. Can you help define what that barbell is and what that might, might mean for the future? Sure. So on one end is you have kind of the Magnificent Seven, um, you know, running around the country, I would say optioning up or locking down large scale infrastructure capacity. Um, and whether they use it or not, or what time frame they use it upon, I will tell. Um, but I think, you know, they're using the their large scale, the capital availability that they have to really lock these sites down. And so um, for us, that would mean somebody like a Microsoft or a Meta or someone coming in saying, hey, we'll take all 300 megawatts. You build us what we need and we'll kind of lease it from you on a long term basis. We'll bring our own chips, you know, and, you know, some of the the, the Mag7 have talked about developing their own GPUs, um, mm -hmm. bring our own equipment, we'll run it. And you effectively are infrastructure you're providing to us and we'll lease it back from you. Um, so that's kind of one end of the spectrum. And when we think about that end of the spectrum, again, what we see happening is, is those players are very aggressive. You know, we, we think in locking down as many of those large scale sites as possible. And when we talk about large scale, it's probably, you know, 200, 300 megawatts plus. Um, so if there's a 30 megawatt site, that's probably not of interest to them but it's really these large scale sites that again, have access to low cost power, zero carbon energy, and ideally also have access to water, right? Because again, if you think about where the GP market is going over the next couple of years, given the density that people are talking about, it will be very likely that, you know, kind of liquid cooling or some form of cooling is going to be integral to operating them in the most efficient way. So that's one end. And so we could, you know, lock it up long-term lease, um, the return profile will be likely be lower, right? I mean, those big players are going to say, hey, you have a long-term lease from us for wonderful credits, and therefore, you know, we shouldn't have to pay you that much because you can kind of go, go, go finance this. And so that's, again, one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum is, you know, these companies that are coming out and saying, hey, you know, we, we're the next latest and greatest AI play. We've just raised 100 million bucks, 200 million bucks. We're worth $2 billion which all sounds great, but when you really think about what does 200 million bucks get you um, with respect to um, the equipment needed to run this stuff, it's actually not that much. You know, when we think about, you know, each megawatt of deployment fully loaded, both infrastructure as well as the GPUs and all the associated equipment with it, you know, kind of that full cluster, you're talking about anywhere from, you know, 20 to 30 million bucks per megawatt. And so even if you have 200 million bucks in cash, how much of that are you going to use just on CapEx? You need to, you know, there's R&D, you need to hire people, you need to kind of run the company. And so these companies actually don't have that much free cash to be able to put towards the infrastructure, right? So ideally, they're looking for places to um, sign, you know, six-month deals, 12-month deals um, to do so. Very different credit than the Magnificent Seven. Time frame on that, that uh, contract is much shorter. Therefore, the rate that they're going to be willing to pay is, is higher. Um, and so we're looking at both and trying to understand both. On the one end with the Magnificent Seven, again, on a, from a CapEx basis, it would largely be infrastructure that we're, spe we're spending. Right? We're putting up the buildings that they will then, you know, use to house their own um, GPUs and clusters. On the other end, you know, depending upon what we do, you know, if we're, if we're really kind of owning the GPU, that's going to be very capital intensive. And again, that's why we're starting with two megawatts. We really want to kind of think through and understand both from an infrastructure and design perspective, but also from a, a business model perspective, what makes sense. Um, or you could just do you know, more of a, a co-location type model, again, where we have infrastructure and then we're, we're having that client or customer bring, you know, pay for finance the equipment on their own and bring it and kind of operate it for us. And so those are the spectrums we're looking at, you know, with the two megawatt deployment by definition, you know, we're playing with you know, some of the smaller players and I would say some of the emerging enterprise players Right. So, you know, there's a number of enterprise level 20, 50, you know, $100 billion type market cap companies yeah. see the need, um, are dabbling and starting to figure out, hey, how are we going to use this tool? Um, and so they're also eager to work with us and say, hey, if we can wait to work for half a megawatt, 
we could grow with you and make it 10 or 15 megawatts if that's what we need over time as well. Yes. So that's kind of the work that we're working through. And again, when you just look at it on pure economics, obviously, you know, again, lower um, at, the, at the, the, the spectrum where you have kind of the, the, the emerging players, you know, they're going to pay you more. And then, you know, you know, with the Magnificent Seven, they're going to pay you less. And so it's really for us, how do we optimize that value of that infrastructure? And how do we optimize the value of that kilowatt hour of electricity that we're delivering to that infrastructure in, in the most meaningful way? Not just today, but again, as we think about, you know, continuing to build the company over time. Yeah, it's... I, it's, I, it's, I, I just want to add something to that, Josh, if that's okay. I mean, you have to look at the genesis of this company, right? We're power developers. We design, develop, sourced, sited built, operated our own facilities. So the, you know, high credit quality, bankable, Magnificent Seven guys are great, but at the end of the day, you're, you're making a return, whether, you know, 7%, you know, maybe maybe a little bit more than that. Um, and you got a nice high multiple, but the value to the shareholders is far greater uh, if you if you choose to go the other route. Um, if you can execute. But again, I would tell you, we're all about execution. You were kind enough when we started the call to talk about how we said what would happen a few years ago. We have delivered on all of that. And Nazar just mentioned, we have been building power plants for ourselves, but for third parties. We built, you know, we've operated power plants for ourselves, but for third parties as well. So we're highly confident in our ability to deliver in this space, but we got to do the work. And, and that's what we're doing. Um, yeah, absolutely. I just want to make sure that we highlight this appropriately because it's such a significant competitive advantage that it, I feel like isn't talked about enough when it comes to Wolf, which is just that of all the Bitcoin miners with scale, I think Wolf is probably the best position to go after those magnificent, magnificent seven. And that's for a couple of reasons, all of which we stated, but I just want to reiterate. So we make sure it's you know talked about is one, you need scale. Two, mm -hmm. you need low power costs. Three, you need green energy. And four, you need consistent uptime, right? And having all four of those right now is not really out there in terms of your competitors, right? Uh, we've seen some of your competitors dabble in the cloud compute, you know, buying their own GPUs. Probably a two-year payback period is what I'm hearing on those GPUs. Uh, and, you know, consistently having that conversation about payback period on GPUs versus Bitcoin miners, which when Bitcoin 70 and we're pre-having can be very low. Uh, so, you know, it's a give and take. But over the long term, when we think about that ultimate data server potential of being an energy provider, yes, you do see significant multiple uplift for the data server equivalent of Terrawolf today, around a 25x EBITDA multiple compared to Bitcoin miners, which trade between 5 and 10x, right? So you immediately see value creation, you see steady stream cash flows and what have you. So I really just you know wanted to make sure we we stuck on that a little bit longer. But for our last 10 minutes or so, I- Gosh, one, one, one yeah. more thing on that. Sorry, I keep interrupting, but it's, I'm a little bit passionate here. <laughs> one other element to these data center sites is latency. So that's an important part. Um, the other thing is when you, you think about it, these guys are massive consumers, right? So, you know, they want they want all 300 megawatts that, that you have at a site. They, they don't want 50 megawatts. They need, you know, 30 acres per- for every 50 or 60 megawatts. So, you know, they want to consume you. And we still very much, even more so believe in the value of Bitcoin. So for Wolf, you know, we don't want our investors to think, yeah, they're going to shift gears and head off to Amazon land. That's not our game. We are Bitcoin miners at the very, you know, at the center of what we are. And uh, I would say the difference between us and anyone out there is, we look at our optionality not being in you know some Bitcoin that we've hodled, but in the electricity that we own and the energy infrastructure that we own so we could generate Bitcoin or go to a higher value use. So that's how we sort of think about it. And, and it requires you know, a great degree of consideration, um, but that's where we're focused. Yeah, understood. Um, for our last couple of minutes, I do want to touch on the balance sheet because it's also a very important part of Terrible's story. So first, I've probably gotten like six questions since this call started about your hodl or the lack thereof, uh, you know, selling Bitcoin every day. We've had a lot of talks about this. You guys know my stance on it, but I'd love to hear a little bit more about yours and kind of how you're thinking about selling Bitcoin every day. Would there be anything that would shift you to embrace a more hodl strategy? So 
we see our job, you invest in TerraWolf because we are a converter, right? We are taking a kilowatt hour of electricity, we're running it through an ASIC, generating hash, which results in some Bitcoin. And on any given day, we can tell you exactly what the profitability of that was. You know, every 10 minute increment, we can tell you exactly what the profitability of that, what, what that was. And so we think our job is to be a converter and we convert, we monetize, we cover our costs, and currently we're paying down our debt. So we think if you want to be, in, you're investing in terrible because we are producing this commodity called Bitcoin at the lowest possible price. And that shows in kind of our total cost of mind, starting from our cost of energy, kind of working, working our way up. And that's the case even though we have debt and a number of our peers have no debt, right? So we have a capital cost associated that's embedded in our cost of mind. And even with that, we are, you know, one of the lowest kind of operators on a cost of mind basis. And so our view is, is we're a converter, we make a commodity, we sell that commodity, we generate profit, and that's kind of what the shareholders are investing in us to do. Yeah. Um, I would argue we hodl. We just don't hodl Bitcoin. We hodl energy. And so we have the energy to find the highest value for it. Okay. So that's important. And I think it's disingenuous. You know, I've been out there on this uh, in the most provocative way. You know, it's not my job to gamble with shareholders' money on whether or not the price of Bitcoin is going up or down. It's my job to make sure we make money mining Bitcoin. So I think public miners should tell the world what does it cost to make Bitcoin? And then they shouldn't like, hodl but mine bitcoin at a loss or they shouldn't hodl and dilute shareholders to death um at the same time i mean the answer is we should be judged on profitability and i think the market will get there um but but that's our focus and mm -hmm. i think it's a lot less expensive for someone who really just wants exposure to bitcoin to be in one of these etfs yeah i, I think that's a great point and you know i realized i said uh you know my house view. I realize there are a lot of investors in the line that may not. We are very much on the side of selling Bitcoin every day. A, because there's already counterparty risk associated with a miner and its ability to execute. If you add Bitcoin selling to that counterparty risk, just mm -hmm. elevates it. Second is if you're selling Bitcoin to cover your costs, you'll naturally dollar cost average at a lower level because you're going to be selling a lot more Bitcoin when Bitcoin's during its bear cycle than its bull cycle. So that's generally how we think about it from a return to shareholder perspective. Um, Lastly, let's touch upon the debt. So, you know, going back to the first thing I said, you guys have been executing on what you've been talking about. A big portion of that was paying down the debt because uh, that, you know, really put you in the penalty box amongst, you know, your peers for quite a while. Can you talk about steps you've taken to pay it down and what future repayments may look like? Sure. I mean, I think it's a great story, right? I mean, we have we have a payment coming up here on Friday, um, will be approximately $30 million, and that will have cut our debt in half from September. Right. So, I mean, literally since September of last year, we will have cut our debt in half. And all of that, almost all of that has been through capital generation of our operating assets. Right. So we made that money mining Bitcoin and selling it at a profit and being able to pay down. So come Friday, we'll be at about seventy six million dollars of debt outstanding. Um, you know, again, a drop from one hundred and forty five million uh, in the third quarter of, of last year. All of it, again, largely through the operations and cash flow generation that we have. And just this quarter alone, again, we'll have generated, you know, over $30 million of free cash flow from Bitcoin mining that will go towards paying down the debt. Given where we are today and given where, you know, we're going to get to, you know, we're going to put, in, we'll be putting on 2X a hash here in June. You know, we think we'll be able to fully pay that debt off uh, by the end of the third quarter, early fourth quarter of this year. And so we continue to kind of see, you know, both, you know, between kind of the growth that we have and the consistent kind of, you know, low cost that we're, we're producing at, um, we're, we're targeting here to get that fully paid off. And so we yep. think it's a good story. And, and again, speaks to, clearly speaks to, we make money mining Bitcoin and we make a lot of money mining Bitcoin. You know, we have a saying at the terrible that not all exahash is created equal. I mean, we really do believe that exahash on a per exahash basis, you know, we are, you know, one of, if not the most, one of the most profitable Bitcoin miners out there. And yeah, Josh, you know, I, Josh, ahead, I, I think the most important thing that, that your client should know is, you know, when I got out of the Navy, I went to Solomon Brothers. I worked proprietary R. Everything was relative value. And we need relative value applied to the space, right? Because, hey, Bitcoin doesn't sell at one price for one guy and another price for another. 
Bitcoin is a market driven price. There's one price. So if my market, it, this month, we made 379 Bitcoin, right? So another guy just announced they made like 425. Adjust the balance sheet for the debt. Adjust the balance sheet for you know Bitcoin holdings. They're trading at two times what we're trading at from a market value. That's insane. And again, we have the value of energy infrastructure. There's another guy produce less. They're, they're almost equal to us in exahash, right? They produce less. They're in tough environments. They've had degradation, didn't perform nearly as well. We did like 20% more and they're trading adjusted balance sheet, like 1.8 times our market cap. So, you know, why would you buy something where in, inherent in it is lower value because they don't own the infrastructure, lower value because it's not ESG oriented, when you could buy my Bitcoin generation at a discount. So I want you to focus and focus your clients on relative value because that's what we're focused on. We're focused on execution. And then we want to make sure that we are always amongst the lowest cost to mine. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, we are running up on time here, but I just like to reiterate, you know, what Paul said and kind of our feelings, you know, uh, Terrible has been one of our best ideas for, for a while now. Uh, you know, we think in terms of this space, there are very few turnaround stories that have successfully executed on that turnaround. And by turnaround, I mean paying down the debt, you know, freeing up capital for growth in the future. And that all ties back to selling Bitcoin every day, right? You've been able to actually take advantage of these higher prices to reduce your leverage and ultimately end up with, we, when we think of all in cost per coin, we do include capital costs. So as you pay down that debt, you are now one of the best, if not the best, as Nazar was saying, uh, position miner to have the most gross profit per Bitcoin, right? Why does that matter? Well, when we're growing in the future, that reduces your need for capital raising, be it through dilution, dilution or future leverage. Best positioned, you know, to really take advantage of that and grow, be it in Bitcoin mining or as we think, one of the best positions for the AI HPC play. So we really like your position right now heading into the halving. You want to be in a low cost miner with room for even more upside in the future. And we think Terrible definitely, uh, you know, encompasses that. So again, want to thank everyone here for their time. Paul, Kerry, Nazar, really do appreciate it. Uh, thanks for turning up. For anyone on the line who wants to talk Terrible in more detail, I'm always available. You can reach out to me, josh.siegler at canner.com. Or, you know, if you really want to talk to the Terrible team, we can help you get connected uh, that way. So, again, thanks for your time today. Hope everyone has a lovely afternoon. Thanks, thanks Josh. Josh. Bye.